Instead of the very complicated state-space representation we just saw, let's consider a very simple system, a system which has a single scalar input u, and it has a single output y. So both scalars, so it's a, what's called a single input, single output system. And we are going to assume that the uh, system is, is, is causal, so we can ignore anything that happens before time zero, and uh, we don't have the ability to look forward in time. And we're also going to assume that it's going to be linear and time invariant. So it's a LTI system. For such a system, which is uh, SISO, causal, and LTI, we know that if we give the input to it, which is going to be delta t, the Dirac delta t, then the output is going to be uh, the what's called the impulse response, and we'll denote that by g of t, where g of t is the impulse response. And let's say that we're given the impulse response somehow. Then the important part is that if you're given an arbitrary input to it, uh, such as uh, u of t, then the output over here is going to be given by u of t convolved with g of t. And uh, this is what we looked at already. And so since the convolution operation is expensive, we can say that the output, this is equal to, equal to y of t, we can say the output taking the convolution on both sides of this equation over here, we can say that y of s is given as us gs. And so this value gs, which is the Laplace transform of the impulse response, is also called the transfer function. So this is actually the precise definition of a transfer function. The earlier value I said earlier of, of h of t and so on is, uh, is not the actual value. This is the precise definition of a transfer function. So uh, this is very good because now if you are given the transfer function and we are able to compute the Laplace transform of the input, and this input should include whatever disturbance that's present, then we know what the output is going to look like. And if you take the inverse Laplace transform, we can get from it y of t, which is what we want in the first place. Um, while studying this, it's very important to realize that the g of s has a particular form that is uh, useful to understand. So this transfer function, g of s, could of course be arbitrary, but in many cases, is of the form ns over ds, where n and d stand for numerator and denominator. And so if you have something in this form, the, and, and these values are both polynomials in S, where ds is a polynomial in S. So it's not an arbitrary function, but in fact a polynomial. Uh, so then the highest power in the polynomial is called the order of the system. So for example, if the denominator is, uh, has a term s squared in it, that would be of order two. And of course, from the fundamental theorem of algebra, we know that a polynomial in s, which has order equal to m, has m roots. That is the m values for which the polynomial is zero. And let's call these m roots alpha one, alpha two, et cetera, to alpha m. Then we can write the denominator on the in the form. We can write the we can write the transfer function in the form g of s equals n of s over uh, something of the form uh, s minus alpha one, s minus alpha two, etc. To s minus alpha n, where some of these alphas could be repeated in the, in case of repeated roots. So for each of these uh, values, we can, uh, if, you, if you have it in this way, then for each of these values where s equals alpha i, g of s 
is going to be infinity, and we call this a pole of the system. So the pole of the system is where the transfer function has the value infinity, and so we can think of the why the output also is being diverging. It means it's going to be infinite. So we certainly don't want uh, uh, these these uh, that system, that to happen. Um, now, if we have something in this form, then this can be rewritten using what's called the partial fraction partial fraction expansion. Uh, which I'll discuss in just a moment. So the partial fraction ex expansion allows us to write this function ns over something like this in the form of some set of terms a over s minus alpha i to the r, where r means that the ith root is repeated r times. So roughly speaking, it's going to look like this, uh, a i uh, s minus alpha i to the uh, value r. And because it's a summation and because the Laplace transform is linear, which means we can take each of these terms separately and we can compute the inverse Laplace transform of this term over here. So the inverse Laplace transform of this individual term is given simply by a t to the r over r factorial e to the alpha i t. Or if you just said r equals 1, this is basically in the simplest case, which is the, also the normal case. It's given by a, uh, sorry, a i, a i t uh, e to the alpha t. And so uh, for this, for, so this is a fairly straightforward uh, a term which is exponential, which is, has alpha in it. Alpha could be complex, of course, uh, because the root of a polynomial could be a complex value. And so essentially we get something that looks like a complex exponential, uh, which is what we studied with signals. And, and so we end up with showing that the if the transfer function is in this format, then the output is going to be the sum of complex exponentials. And those we should be understanding pretty well by now. And so this uh, is the reason why we'd like to have the system be uh, in the form that can be written in this fashion. Uh, okay, let's take a little bit more into this, uh, uh, delve into a little bit more. Let's look at this value alpha over here. If this value alpha is negative, then we're going to get a function of time which is kind of going to go down with time. That didn't work out very well. Uh, on the other hand, if it's positive, then it's going to go up with time. And if it's zero, then of course we're going to get uh, oscillatory behavior. So we would like a system to be something that has a response that declines with time. We don't want it to go up with time. So what does that mean? We'd like the alpha i to be less than zero, uh, strictly less than zero if you can, or is at zero if you want to keep it oscillatory. What does that mean? It means that we would like these values to be less than zero, and these are just the roots of the denominator of the transfer function. So if you start with the transfer function like this, and we can go from that transfer function to this form, ns by ds, we can compute the roots of this equation, and then we try to see, are these roots positive or negative? So we go from the m roots, and we look at the location of these n roots in the complex plane. And if these values are less than 0, in fact, the real value of the roots is less than 0, then we'll have a system that is going to behave nicely. It's going to go decline with time. On the other hand, if the roots are, or even one of the roots is greater than or equal to 0, then we're going to have problems. So this allows us to get some sense of what a stable system looks like. And we'll come to the problem of stability uh, later.